For right troops, it's your man Chris Scullion from TyrollHack.com. Well, the PlayStation Classic is out in just under a month. It's out on the 3rd of December uh, for the price of £89.99. For that, you'll get two controllers um, which have USB connections, which is interesting, so I wonder if that means it'll work on the PS3 or maybe even the PC. Um, and you'll also get 20 classic PlayStation 1 games uh, pre-installed on it. Um, now obviously not everyone knows all 20 of these games well, but that is where your man Scullion comes in because I will um, now proceed to kind of talk about all 20 games just so you kind of have a rough idea as to what is on offer here and whether it sounds like your cup of joe as they say in the trade or indeed your can of wine brew. So let's get cracking. First up is Battle Arena Toshinden. Uh, this was a launch game in America and Europe. Um, it was a kind of basic fighting game. It was, this is right about the time when fighting games were first making the switch to 3D. So you had Virtua Fighter and Tekken and stuff like this. Um, so Toshinden was one of the, the launch games. Most people of the kind of early PlayStation era remember it because it was um, on the demo disc called Demo 1 that came with the PlayStation originally. Um, in later years the demo disc was replaced and updated over the years but uh, the, the first kind of batch of demo discs had a Toshinden uh, demo on them. Um, the game itself is pretty basic these days. It, it was kind of unique because at the time because it was like a proper 3D fighting game you could press L1 and R1 and you could do a kind of roll or a flip to the side uh, which meant you could kind of not just go forwards and backwards but go sideways as well so that was quite cool but um, these days it's really basic um, they, you can't really string together good combos or anything like that it's, it's, it's a pretty um, a pretty underwhelming fighting game by today's standards especially because as we get later on down the list Tekken 3 is in here uh, which kind of makes uh, Tushinden a bit pointless um, other kind of better fighting games were out and, and obviously maybe for licensing reasons or for third party reasons maybe they, Sony couldn't get deals with them I would have liked to have seen uh, maybe Dead, the first Dead or Alive or maybe Tobal Number 1 which is a kind of underrated fighting game they would have been good to be on there but either way Toshinden is the one that a lot of kind of early Playstation gamers will remember so that's that's why it's in there probably up next is Cool Borders 2 a snowboarding game uh, and obviously the sequel to Cool Borders 1. Um, first Cool Borders was decent but it only had five courses, uh, three courses and two hidden ones, um, and you couldn't race against anyone. It was a kind of time trial -y, um part time trial, part stunt based, get as high a score as possible type thing. Um, cool Borders 2 felt like more of a kind of rounded game. Um, it had 10 courses and you had CPU opponents who you were racing against. Um, it had these kind of big air contests where you could do tricks um, and half pipe competitions where you did tricks and then those were kind of split up. You would do a big air one, then you would do a race and a big air, then a race. Um, and the races were like kind of trying to get first. Basically, however well you did in the big air trick contests, uh, that would determine your position in the race. Uh, so the better score you got in doing the tricks. Um, the further up the grid you would start. Um, it's fine, it's fun. It's It still holds up reasonably well today. Obviously it doesn't look anywhere near as good. This is, this is going to be an interesting thing whether this PlayStation Classic is going to have any scaling options um, or whether it's going to be presented as is. You would hope that there will be some sort of... Um, not that we're wanting it to be uh, ridiculous levels of like 4K support where, uh, Three, t four times AA and aliasing and all that kind of stuff, but it'd be nice if, if it upscaled reasonably nicely uh, for HD tellies because um, a lot of well, obviously this is the early era of 3D games, uh, polygonal games, and and they didn't uh, they don't age as well as like 16-bit sprite-based games do, and they're kind of timeless. But these aren't these these look quite rough, um, and Cool Borders 2 is, a, is an example of that. So hopefully um, the scaling there'll be a scaling option in here or just something to smooth smooth the, the rough edges a bit. But either way, it's a fun enough game and um, it'll keep you busy for a wee while. As well, Destruction Derby, uh, which was another kind of launch era, launch window game um, and also was on the, the first demo disc. Uh, this was developed by Reflections Interactive, uh, who ended up developing the Driver games, which are also uh, not on on the PlayStation Classic, Driver and Driver 2 could have been good good shouts, but not on there. 
Um, Reflections Interactive became Ubisoft Reflections, and obviously yeah, Ubisoft bought them out, um, and they continued. They're, they're still going to this day. They help out in games like The Crew and Far Cry Five, so they kind of they still kind of lend their expertise. Um, I really like Destruction Derby. That was one of my favourite games at launch. Um, many people would say the second game was better because it had better. Um, kind of the, the physics were more interesting because cars could come off the ground and Destruction Derby won that the cars are very much rooted to the track uh, you can't lift them off the air but in Destruction Tar Derby 2 they flew all, all over the place uh, but here they're kind of rigid there's three kind of game modes in this one there's Wrecking Racing where you kind of race around tracks and smash into people uh, Stock Car Racing which is similar and Destruction Derby mode where you're just a big ball and you get to smash everyone the, contrary to what you might think it's not about smashing into the aim of the game isn't to smash into cars, that, that'll just ruin your car and then you'll, you'll, you'll lose. The aim is you get points by spinning other cars, so the aim is to hit a car um, ideally at the back, um, or at the front would be nice, but um, hit them at the back and that spins them more, and if you can get them to spin 360 degrees you get the most points, but you get points for spinning them 90 degrees or 180 degrees. So yeah, it's not really about smashing into cars, it's about smashing into the back of cars and spinning them. Um, that's the that's the trick here. Um, if you struggle with it, the, the, the famous cheat is if you do um, put in your name as uh, an exclamation mark, then damage the exclamation mark, uh, your car won't take any damage. It'll be unbreakable and that'll make it a lot easier. But there you go. Next up is Final Fantasy VII. Uh, not really much needs to be said about this one, but for those not familiar, this is like the famous... wasn't just one of the best RPGs ever made, um, although I prefer date, but that was me. I'm in a minority. Um, it was a pretty iconic one when it came to the console war because it involved jumping ship, basically. Uh, Squaresoft, who, who, which was what they were called at the time before they merged with Enix to become Square Enix, um, they had originally planned to make Final Fantasy VII. Uh, it was originally going to be a 2D game, then they decided to go 3D with it. Um, and they were going to make it for the Nintendo 64. Uh, specifically the Nintendo 64 DD kind of disc drive um, but then when Nintendo insisted on using cartridges instead of CDs uh, Squaresoft kind of went well stuff you then and made the jump to PlayStation instead because CDs could hold more um, and the rest is history the rest is Final Fantasy 7 uh, still an epic RPG to this day and obviously you've got the remake coming God knows when and I think that's still years off um, but yeah, this is a this is still a classic RPG. It's looking a bit rough around the edges these days, which is to be expected. But it still looks and it still sounds great, um, and it's still fun enough to play. So, and if you've somehow managed to get this far without um, knowing about his twists, then you're in for a treat. There you go. Um, another iconic one is Grand Theft Auto, uh, the original Grand Theft Auto created by DMA Design, um, who had previously made Lemmings. Um, and had just finished making Body Harvest on Nintendo 64. So then they moved on to this prototype called Race and Chase, which eventually became uh, Grand Theft Auto. Um, and then obviously DMA eventually became Rockstar North, but that wasn't for a while. Um, this is still a nice wee callback to the early days of Grand Theft Auto, the very first GTA. It was actually it was the foundation for most of the games. When you, if you play it nowadays, um, you can see we kind of nods that the, the, the later games would kind of build on. So for example, the first GTA. Um, Technically, it took place over three levels, uh, three different levels. Um, you, you answered, you went to phone boxes and basically answered the phone and took on missions. Um, and as you took on missions, you would build a multiplier. And when your multiplier hit a certain target, I think the first level was a million dollars, and then it, it kind of grew with each stage. Once you hit that target, you could then move on to the next area. And the three areas were Liberty City, Vice City, and San Andreas, uh, which obviously became the settings for. All the Grand Theft Auto games going forward. Um, obviously, Liberty City was in GTA 3 and 4, Vice City was in Grand Theft Auto Vice City, and San Andreas was in Grand Theft Auto San Andreas and GTA 5. So, yeah, so this is the early days. It's, it's obviously far more basic and it's top down. As you can see here, it's, the frame rate's quite iffy because although it's top down, it's still using 3D models. Um, so the PlayStation's still kind of, it's not like it's a smooth 60 frames or anything like that, it's still quite choppy. Uh, but a lot of the kind of stuff that made Grand Theft Auto what it is, you can see even in this early uh, day, like getting chased by the police and the different cars having different radio stations and all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, I still enjoy it. I, I've been playing it for 
capturing the footage for this I ended up putting another couple of hours in it so it's definitely still got that um, that hook although you may want to jump into the options and change the controls because the controls obviously changed over the years um, and in this one square gets in and out of your car instead of triangle so there's a lot of times where I'm trying to brake and I get out of my car instead yeah, instead so yeah you want to change that but either way still a cracking game um, some would say that it should have been Grand Theft Auto 2 instead but I think that got a bit too complicated for its own good because it had like gang warfare in there and all that and you had different meters uh, to, to determine how well you got on with each all different gangs and stuff I couldn't be bothered with that first GTA is pure <laughs> it's, it's a nice game um, next up is Intelligent Cube IQ Intelligent Cube um, known in Europe as Kurushi but it looks like this is all going to be um, American NTSC uh, games to ensure that they're 60 frames a second so it'll be similar to the NES Classic and the SNES Classic in that even in Europe it'll be the American versions of the game so I'm assuming that's why we're getting Intelligent Cube and not Kurushi which is what it was called in Europe um, this is a really interesting addition and this is the one a lot of people were complaining about uh, when they saw the list of 20 games um, and this was one of them and people were saying what, why is it not this, why is it not that, why Why are we getting Intelligent Cube instead. Um, he actually did really well in Japan, I'm assuming that's one of the reasons. It shifted about 750,000 copies in Japan um, and won the Excellence Award for Interactive Art at the 97 Japan Media Arts Festival so it's kind of well praised um, and it's good I, 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 again capturing the footage for it I ended up putting a lot of time into it uh, the aim is basically to uh, these waves of blocks come towards you and um, you press a button uh, to turn the f one of the tiles blue um, and then you press the button again to turn the tile red um, and if the tile is red when a block lands on it you kind of capture that block and make it disappear so the aim is to capture all the blocks um, the the grey blocks uh, you have to capture them the green ones um, like you kind of trigger explosions that, that, that make nine block radiuses um, and the black ones you have to avoid you've got to let them drop off the edge without capturing them um, and that's, that's pretty basic this, this one comes with a tutorial which is useful a lot of games back then didn't uh, you had to resort to the manual but it's not quite clear whether these will have manuals with them in digital form so it's a good job this one comes with a pretty uh, decent tutorial which literally shows you the game playing and it has a guy explaining it to you so um, you won't be stuck and not know how to play this one and it's good it's I know that when you looked at the list of 20 games if you did uh, Intelligent Cube is probably the one that stuck it stuck out stuck out the most as being hmm, what's going on here but um, it's good, give it a chance because it's actually it's actually quite good. It's a shame it's not the sequel, there was a re-release, um, a kind of enhanced uh, version called IQ Final, which had extra modes in it, but it only came out in Japan and Europe, um, so I'm assuming that's why we don't have that one in the PlayStation Classic, because if it is based off American copies and it never came out in America, then that's why we're getting this one, I think. So there we go. Uh, Jump and Flash next. Uh, which was so far ahead of its time. Uh, this is one of the first ever kind of 3D platformers. It's, but it's not really a platformer, but it is as well because uh, it's first person. But um, but yeah, it came out like a full year before Mario 64, so it was still one of the earliest games that um, had you jumping around a 3D space at least. Uh, so you play as this kind of robotic rabbit called Robit, as you do, um, and in each level you've got to find a bunch of jet pods which are basically just carrots, you've got to find all the carrots in the stage. Um, you do this by shooting all the enemies that come at you and collecting the power-ups. But also you've got this ridiculously big triple jump, which is like big massive jet boost jumps. Um, so you can get a blast miles up into the air with these jumps, that's brilliant. But the the the, 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 the best thing, that the kind of... the thing that, that makes it what it is, is when you do these big massive jumps, your character looks down at the ground, um, which makes it so much easier to kind of line up your jumps and land properly and it's something that a lot of first person shooters messed up in the years that followed. A lot of early FPS games um, had jumping sections like Turok and stuff like that had sections where you jump from platform to platform and invariably those were almost impossible because you could never really get your bearings because you, you couldn't see your feet. 
you were jumping blind most of the times, even though you thought you were reaching the jump, you were actually plummeting to your death because you weren't able to line it up properly. The fact that jumping flash when you leapt into the air, you automatically looked right down, it made it so much easier because you could land on enemies, you could land on um, blocks. It's actually, it, to this day, it's still great to control. Um, so yeah, um, I'm happy jumping flash is in there. It was quite an early game, such an underrated game. Um, I think you'll enjoy it if you haven't played it before. A game that isn't underrated is Metal Gear Solid, uh, which is just a classic. Uh, sold more than 6 million copies. Um, and even though it wasn't the first Metal Gear game, there was one on the NES and there was another one on the MSX, I believe. Uh, this is clearly the one that properly kind of kick-started the series and made it what it is today. Um, it still has long cutscenes. I don't, I'm not actually a massive fan of the Metal Gear Solid series in general because I hate long cutscenes in games. Um, and the longer it went on, like I played, started playing two and just gave up. And from that point on, I've kind of not been fussed about it. But I did enjoy one because it had long cutscenes, but they're nowhere near as bad as they were in later on games, uh, the, the later uh, Metal Gear Solid games. Um, although when you play through it now, like again, I was playing through it for capture footage. Um, some elements haven't really aged very well. I'm, I'm not looking forward to the obvious. There, there's going to be some. Uh, website somewhere who's going to write an editorial about how oh, Metal Gear Solid hasn't aged well in this day and age because he's basically he's, he's trying to he chats up every woman he comes across, uh, whether it's the woman um, on his codec like like kind of getting in touch, or whether it's Meryl the kind of woman that he encounters near the start. He's always always trying to hit on women, um, so I'm sure there'll be an article at some point saying oh Snake, uh, this game doesn't hold up to to today's era. Which okay, fair enough. Uh, but if you can cope with that, it's still an excellent game. Although it's a shame that these DualShock, yeah, not, they're not DualShock. It's a shame that these controllers aren't DualShock controllers because um, analog kind of running was better than digital running on in Metal Gear Solid, and there was enough to be tricks later on where, like Psycho Man, this would appear and make your controllers rumble and stuff like that, and that obviously doesn't happen there because there's no, presumably no rumble in these controllers. Um, so that's a shame. But otherwise, still, still a very good game. Um, Mr. Driller's another one that had that saw a couple of people complaining about, which is mental because um, it's one of my favourite games of the twenty here. Uh, it's so basic. Like even looking at it just now in this video, you're probably thinking, mm, really? But it's uh, it's just daft. It's probably it's, it's basically it's a, it's a spiritual sequel to Dig Dug. Uh, but it's not really anything to do with Dig Dug, you play as this week out with a drill. Um, and there's three different modes, there's arcade mode where you pick one or two different depths and you've got to reach that depth by drilling down. Uh, there's time attack, you've got to do it as quickly as you can. And then there's survival mode, which is basically an endless mode, which is great fun. Um, so yeah, the aim is just to keep drilling down as long as you can. And uh, When you drill a colour, all the other colours, um, all the other blocks of the same colour attached to it all disappear at the same time. Uh, which means you can potentially create problems for yourself by making uh, blocks land on your head and stuff and you're always running out of fuel so you need to keep picking up uh, uh, oxygen, sorry, so you need to keep picking up oxygen and it's brilliant. I love Mr. Driller, it's, it's, it works better as a handheld game but it, um, even as a PlayStation, even as like a TV based game it's still massively addictive uh, once you get into it so um, if, you turned your, if you turned your nose up at Mr. Driller being on there on the list, just do me a favour and try it uh, because I like it, it's one of my favourites. Um, very underrated puzzle game. Uh, up next is Odd World Abe's Odyssey. This is a very, very popular game back in the day. Um, obviously, it got a remake in 2014, it's Odd World New and Tasty, so obviously, it's got a following still. Um, it's a kind of puzzle platformer you play as Abe, who's like a slave worker in a kind of food factory type thing. Um, he realises that him and his other slaves are going to be turned into food so he decides to escape and try and take as many slaves with him uh, so they all escape. Uh, his main gimmick was this thing called Game Speak where you'd hold down a button and press various other buttons and that would let you speak to them say, say stuff like uh, follow me and wait here and all that kind of stuff so um, you could talk to talk to other slaves and get them to follow you, it was quite good. Um, you played a bit like other kind of puzzle platformers of the era, so stuff like, uh, well, I say of the era a bit earlier, like so stuff like Prince of Persia and Another World or Out of This World if you're American, um, and Flashback. In that, it's kind of awkward and clunky to control. The controls weren't very 
uh, fluid or intuitive it was kind of quite clunky and so you die quite a lot because he ran maybe too far or, or it was just kind of awkward but that was kind of considered part of the challenge in those kind of games that was the thing was that you had to take your time and you couldn't just run through it because it wasn't designed for that so it was never really my type of thing but, but I, a lot of people loved it so um, me, you may love it too so there you go up next, Revelations Persona. This is a bizarre choice, uh, given that you would imagine this PlayStation Classic is partly designed to appeal to a more kind of casual audience, the sort who played Wipeout and the like back in the day. Um, incidentally, a lot of people saying why is Wipeout not on it? Be probably because there's no chance they'd go to the hassle of the license and all that music again, and um, all the Chemical Brothers and Prodigy music. There's no point. Um, but yeah, Persona is pretty hardcore RPG so it's strange that they would add that to a system that you would hope a lot of uh, late 20 somethings will, will be getting as Christmas presents by their partners because it's oh I remember I used to play the Playstation when I was a kid when I was a teenager I would imagine the vast vast majority of people who get this Playstation Classic will have no interest in Persona whatsoever this is a really hardcore kind of RPG and you would imagine a lot of people that would that would be into it enough would have already kind of found ways to play it through emulators or what have you instead. Either way, it's the first game in the Persona series, which itself is this kind of spin off of the Shin Megami, the Megami Tensai games. Um, it's an RPG about a bunch of school kids who can summon these personas, which are like inner creatures that come from their souls or something like that. It's got a kind of fiddly battle system where you've got to move move your characters about on a grid. Um, and there isn't really much in the way tutorials, so it's not very kind of user friendly. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see the feedback to this one once the PlayStation Classic is kind of in people's hands. Um, it'll be interesting to see a lot of people going, why the hell is this on here? Because this is it's just an odd game to, to add on. I, I understand that Persona is popular these days, and that's probably why it's on there. Uh, but I'd imagine a lot of people who like the likes of kind of Persona 4 Golden and stuff like that aren't really going to get much out of this one by all accounts. I'm not a massive RPG fan but by all accounts the series has progressed quite a lot um, over time and this may be too big a step backwards. But there you go. Uh, Rayman Next is another PlayStation launch title in the West. Uh, but I remember at the time it was mostly at launch, when the PlayStation launched, most people pretty much ignored Rayman uh, because it was a 2D platformer and pretty much everyone was buying a PlayStation because obviously it did 3D polygonal games, everyone was too busy focusing on like Ridge Racer and Tekken and stuff like that. Um, even like Battle Arena to Shinden, nobody cared about uh, Rayman so much. Um, but it kind of, it won the long game, it ended up being, uh, actually being the best selling PlayStation game in the UK. Um, it sold like 5 million copies in Britain or something like that, there's some, some ridiculous number like that. But that's probably mainly because um, it was bundled all the time, <laughs> like at Argos, if you bought a PlayStation from Argos at any time, um, they would always chuck in a copy of Rayman just for the hell of it, they obviously had millions of them lying about, um, so I think that's maybe one of the reasons it did so well, is it was, it was always chucked in uh, with a PlayStation when you bought it. Um, it actually came out in the Jaguar first, but only by about a week, then it came out in the PlayStation, but there you go. Um, it's still fun, and it still looks quite pretty, but um, it is quite difficult in places. Uh, but that's not Tori, I suppose. I suppose he's armless enough. Sorry. Um, up next, Resident Evil Director's Cut. Um, it's a no brainer, obviously. Um, Resident Evil is a given. It's such a massive series, and the, although it wasn't a, a PlayStation exclusive, it was on the Saturn as well. Um, the, the PlayStation is where it kind of. Uh, became enormously popular so it makes sense that Resident Evil would be on there. The Director's Cut was the kind of re-release which added a couple extra versions so you had the, no the original kind of normal version of the game. You had a training version which is kind of basically an easy difficulty, it gave you more, a lot more bullets and made the game a lot easier. Um, and then there's this advanced kind of or arranged version which is, uh, which is basically the Director's Cut element where all the enemies have been moved and all the objects have been moved and stuff like that, and your, your gun's better, and etc. Um, it'll be interesting to see if it's a normal director's cut, um, or if it's the Shock version, which was like the third version that they brought out. So they brought out Resident Evil, then Resident Evil director's cut, and then Resident Evil director's cut, Shock version. 
Um, and although obviously these controllers aren't dual shocks, then it'll be interesting to see if that's the version we get, especially because it was famous for its the dual shock version soundtrack. They got a new soundtrack and it had a couple of atrociously bad uh, theme tunes in it. Oh, Barry! That was too close. You were almost a Jill sandwich. <laughs> You're right. Up next is Ridge Racer Type 4. This is my this is my pick of all 20 games on the PlayStation Classic. This is my favourite one. Um, I'm a big Ridge Racer fan and Type 4 has always been my favourite game in the series. Um, it looks great. Obviously, these days it's, it doesn't look as good. Uh, but it was such great fun to play. The drifting mechanics were fantastic. Um, the music is immaculate. Like, you, you, I regularly listen, download and listen to the soundtrack. Um, have it on my phone. Um, it's an incredible sounding game. Uh, the only the only kind of issue with it was it had 320 cars in it, which was for the time was a ridiculous number of cars in the game. Um, and you unlocked cars depending on there's like a championship mode with like um, what was it seven races or eight races in it, um, and it split up into different sections. And the cars you unlocked for each section depended on your positions. Um, so if you finished first in your first four races, you would get this type of car. If you finished first, 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 second, you would get another type of car. If you finished first, second, second, first, you would get another type of car. And that's how you ended up with 320 cars, all these different possibilities. The problem was, if you got all 320, you unlocked a special Pac-Man car, which is like Pac-Man and a wee UFO thing and it un unlocks a new Pac-Man music track and it's fantastic. So I, back in the day I actually did that, I, I worked out every permutation of every different position to finish in um, so I could unlock the Pac-Man car and it took hundreds of hours but it was, it was worth it. Um, so don't do that this time because it's not really worth it because you haven't really deliberately finished second or third in some races but um, no, I just showed you how much I love Ridge Racer Type 4. This is, this is a brilliant racing game, brilliant arcade style racing game. Um, it only just makes me wish there was a new Ridge Racer, uh, maybe one day. Up next, Super Puzzle Fighter 2 Turbo, um, it was a puzzle game obviously based on Street Fighter. It isn't the greatest competitive, it isn't the greatest competitive puzzle game ever made. Um, in my eyes that will always be Dr. Mario, believe it or not, a lot of people would say Tetris, but uh, once you've played Dr. Mario online on WiiWare against other people, just nothing, nothing ever comes close. Um, so it's not the best ever, but it's decent enough. And the wee kind of chibi versions of Street Fighter characters fighting each other in the middle of the screen are quite cool. It's a shame it isn't um, Super Gem Fighter Mini Mix instead, which kind of came out later and was like used those same kind of mini chibi characters, but put them in a proper fighting game. It'd be nice to have had that instead, because as, as a puzzle game, I've never really been a big Super Puzzle Fighter 2 Turbo fan. Uh, but there you go, it's, 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 that seems to be the game that just kind of gets put in as many compilations as possible, so there you go, there it is again. Uh, then there's Siphon Filter, which is a kind of action game, but it's got a strong kind of stealth element to it, uh, which means I was never a big fan. I, I hate stealth in games, um, probably why, another reason why I wasn't too keen on Metal Gear uh, Solid, but um, yeah, Siphon Filter is quite heavy with, his, with the stealth. Um, although not as heavy as Splinter Cell, which isn't here. Uh, Siphon Filter still had a good deal more action. Like you were, you it was, you were more encouraged, maybe encouraged, but it was easier to kind of run through just blasting people in that than it was in games like Splinter Cell. Um, you play as a special agent called Gabriel Logan. He's got to basically take out a German terrorist. It was kind of bandied about as a mix between Goldeneye and Metal Gear Solid, but it's not really as good as either of those. I, I don't think. Although I seem to be in the minority, a lot of people just absolutely love it, so um, take my opinion with a pinch of salt there. Um, it was it was popular enough at least to lead to another five games in the series, so there you go. But there hasn't been a new one in like 11 years, so hopefully this will kind of scratch your itch and might even inspire Cos to bring it back if enough people get a PlayStation Classic and go, hey, Siphon Filter was good, by the way, so we'll see. Uh, what else? Then there's Tekken 3. Um... This is this is the this is the right one to add. I think there was three Tekken games in the PlayStation, and this I think is the the obvious one to go for. The first Tekken was obviously iconic because another kind of launch window game that helped the PlayStation go kind of go head to head with the Virtua uh, with Virtua Fighter on the Saturn, um, which is kind of a battle that Tekken won. As far as most people were concerned, that that was that was the game. 
yeah, that did better than Virtua Fighter. Um, Tekken 2 then came out and it was better. That had like 20 odd characters, but 25 characters in it and tweaked the fighting system a wee bit. But Tekken 3 was was the daddy. That was a big one. Um, it added, it removed a lot of characters from 1 and 2, but added a bunch of new ones. Eddie Gordo was the famous one. Like Eddie was the kind of Brazilian capoeira dance fighting type guy. Um, he was, everyone played as him basically. Uh, and it also added some really weird modes like Tekken Ball, which is like a, a volleyball type game. Um, and Tekken Force, which is like a side scroll and beat em up thing. Um, so yeah, Tekken 3 is still one of the best fighting games ever made, so it's, it's good that it's in here. Yeah, it's a kind of another no brainer, I think. Weird one next Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six is in there, which is a kind of tactical shooter, uh, which meant that instead of just running in and kind of pumping bullets into everyone, you had to go through this planning phase first, uh, where you choose your kind of squad mates and then give them commands and stuff like that. Um, I get the feeling this one's only in here because uh, Rainbow Six Siege is still doing well on like, Xbox One and PS4 um, and PC. I certainly don't think it's here on its own merit because even when it came out at the time, I remember magazines saying oh, the PC version of this is brilliant but the console one's rubbish, the PlayStation one's rubbish. So it's odd that a game that people didn't really love back then, even back then, the, 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 the Sony seemed to think that 20 years later... Uh, they're going to magically love it now because they because there's a better game out on PS4. Uh, but there you go, Rainbow Six is there. At least it's there as a as a, a little curio, so you can see what the rain, how the Rainbow Six series started compared to what it is now. Two more to go. Up next is Twisted Metal, another one of my favourites. So other than Ridge Racer, this is my second uh, pick, my second favourite. Uh, Twisted Metal is a kind of basically like a third person deathmatch type game but instead of running about you're in a car instead and um, so there's loads of different cars you can choose from and they've all got their own strengths and weaknesses there's like a wee motorbike there's a uh, police car etc um so it's got a story it's like a racing game with a, a, a racing ve vehicular combat i believe they call it uh one of those games but um it's got a plot so it's about this guy called calypso this kind of mysterious guy nobody knows who he is he set up this tournament um, and he promises that whoever wins the tournament will get anything they want at all, no matter what it is, no matter how expensive it is, or even how impossible it seems. It's like he's some sort of devil character. So if you want to like bring your brother back from the dead, he can do that as well. Or if you just want a million dollars, he can give you that. Um, so each character, when you choose the character, each character's got their own reason for entering. So that gives you, it, it makes it interesting because they've all got their own unique endings as well. And there's a kind of twist to every ending because obviously Clips is a sneaky kind of guy. Um, so you've got um, this, there's a black guy in it who wants Calypso to end the crime in his neighbourhood. It's quite stereotypical. Um, there's a special agent guy in it who he's looking for proof that aliens exist. And there's an object he knows that Calypso will be able to give him that he can prove aliens exist. And there's even there's like a ghost called he drives a car called Spectre, yes, yeah, so it's like a ghost car, um, and he just wants to be resurrected. He wants to get his life back, um, his, his body back. Um, the best of the bunch, the kind of iconic character in it is a guy called Needles Kane, uh, who drives an ice cream truck called Sweet Tooth. But these days he's just called the character is just called Sweet Tooth, even though it was originally that was the name of the ice cream truck. Uh, but he was in. PlayStation All Stars Battle Royale fighting game uh, as just Sweet Tooth. Um, so he enters a contest to find his best friend. He wants his best friend back. Um, and the risk of sounding like a kind of clickbait website, you won't believe <laughs> what his secret friend, his best friend, ends up being. Yes, yeah, so that's good. Um, it's a shame it isn't Twisted Metal 2 World Tour because that was a much better game, I thought. That was the same sort of idea, but it had more characters and it had like. Uh, you, you went to different locations around the world and one of them was Paris, you could blow up the Eiffel Tower in that one, teleport to the top and then drive down the, the spire which is there kind of lying on its side you could drive down that onto the rooftops and stuff that was brilliant, yes, it's a shame it's not that but Twisted Metal is still a brilliant kind of uh, car combat game um, it's great in two player mode as well which is good because you've obviously got it comes with two controllers so that's good um, and then finally there's Wild Arms, uh, you could probably argue that PlayStation Classic maybe doesn't need a third RPG because you've got Final Fantasy 7 in there for the kind of, for the majority and then you've even got Persona in there for people, the kind of hardcore who want something more kind of 
thorough to get their teeth into. But so you could probably argue, well, why is there a third one on here when there's only twenty games? But um, especially because there's only one platformer in there, like Rayman. If you don't count Jumping Flash as a platformer, because it's more a kind of first person. Um, collect them up type thing. There's only one platformer in there, which is Rayman, but, but yeah, there's three RPGs, but there you go. Um, to be fair, Wild Arms is a decent wee uh, game. It's set in the Old West, which is kind of unique for uh, R the RPG uh, genre. Um, and it uses kind of 2D graphics when you're exploring, but then switches into 3D when you're fighting people, which is quite cool. This is again a basic uh, turn-based RPG, but it's cool. It's got a decent wee story, and it's 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 fun enough uh, from what I've played of it. Um, but yeah, there you go. That's the 20 games. That's your that's your uh, your wax. So you've got Battle Arena to Shinden, Kill Borders 2, Destruction Derby, Final Fantasy 7, Grand Theft Auto, Intelligent Cube, Jump and Flash, Metal Gear Solid, Mr. Driller. Oddworld, Abe's Odyssey, Revelations Persona, Rayman, Resident Evil Director's Cut, Ridge Racer Type 4, Super Puzzle Fighter 2 Turbo, Siphon Filter, Tekken 3, Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six, Twisted Metal and Wild Arms. That's a decent selection, I think. There will always be people saying, what about XYZ? Why is Crash Bandicoot not there? Why is Spyro the Dragon not there? Uh, I would imagine that's because of the remakes that are uh, out and coming soon, respectively. And I imagine that Activision didn't want anyone stepping on their toes in that regard. People saying, why is Wipeout not in there? Like I say, probably because of the music licensing issues. Why is Gran Turismo not in there? Again, probably because of car licensing issues. So there's reasons why a lot of these games probably aren't in there. Same deal with Die Hard Trilogy. Uh, presumably the Die Hard license no longer uh, applies to uh, whoever it was that re released it. Um, so yeah, so a lot of games were disqualified immediately, just purely for licensing reasons. Um, but from what is there, it's a half decent selection, I think. Um, everyone's always going to have their own tweaks and preferences. I mean, I would rather have had Final Fantasy VIII instead of seven. I'd rather have had uh, Twisted Metal Two instead of Twisted Metal One. Uh, but th by and large, um, I'm quite happy with that. And I've had even just uh, all the footage in this video is taken from original PlayStation hardware. Uh, so I played through all these games again on an original PlayStation just for the sake, just to capture the footage of this video, and just kind of really enjoyed most of them again. So it bodes well for the for the PlayStation Classic. There's a couple of stinkers to Shinden. It's it's too clunky for for modern gaming now. I think so. Tishinden's maybe a bit of a waste of time. Um, and Persona's quite quite hard going again and Rainbow Six was never good arguably in the first place so that's a weird one but you're talking I'd say of the 20 games at least 15 of them for most people will be like this is a good game kind of situation so so that's good um, but hopefully that helped hopefully that helped kind of shed some light on some of the games you may not have been too familiar with um, I will uh, try and get a review of the PlayStation Classic up as soon as possible once it comes up, uh, once it comes out. It'll be interesting to see, like I say, whether it's got any kind of upscaling or smoothing features just to make these kind of games look a bit better, or whether it'll just be a bare bones, here is here is your games, pick the one you want uh, situation. So we'll see. Um, but yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting, interesting times. Um, I'm looking forward to trying it out. So thanks for watching, please do go to tidalhack.com if you want more gaming goodness and more kind of coverage of uh, these sort of things and do all the YouTube stuff that you're supposed to do, you know, the kind of liking and uh, subscribing and ticking the wee alarm bell or whatever has that, you know, you know how it works, um, you know the drill, the, the drill by now. But yeah, thanks for watching, if you enjoyed this I've got other videos up uh, explaining uh, the NES games that are available on Switch Online, I'll put we kind of logos up for them just now so check them out as well um, and also the uh, uh, explained the games that were on the SNES Mini too uh, so hopefully you enjoy those videos too if you haven't seen them before otherwise I'll catch you on the flip flop with another video soon thanks for watching guys bye bye